my talk will be I know, quite different from what you have been listening to as of now. I am more of an implementation person rather than uh, the framework or the build up of the theory. And so um, one of the issues that I have been looking at recently is the importance of the aspect of coherence. And um, as I had asked John, this will perhaps also become clear as, as we go along as to why I am interested to know whether we can put together lots of systems to give rise to a large quantum computer working as a whole as a quantum system. So, you know, systems which are put together, they are defined as pi part rate and other kinds of situations. But here, uh, before getting into those details, I have one or two slides which are very preliminary, but Vishal has done a wonderful job. But uh, nevertheless, given the waves uh, doing of quantum computing, we have in the community sort of decided to ratify the facts as to what we mean by quantum computers. In typical terms, quantum computer essentially is a system which realistically does the processing in terms of quantum mechanical sense. We are using the Schrodinger's equation, which is quantum mechanical way of looking at things. And whenever we do that, that's the only time when we define a quantum computer. Anything else can be alternative forms of computation, which, is, which can be quite interesting and everything, but it's not quantum. So that is one very important realization which we should keep in mind when we make claims. Um, and the definition definitely brings into the point that we are talking about a classical, uh, not a classical bit, but a quantum bit. Although there are areas, as I will get into, as we shall also alluded to, that light somehow behaves in an area which is somewhere in the middle. It's not quite a quantum bit, but it is something more than a bit. And so there are areas where you can get into the gray areas. So the uh, this aspect has also been alluded to, unless and until you get into measurement, nothing is uh, defined. And that is the power of quantumness. In quantumness, what we are assuming or what we are focusing on is the fact that the probabilities are not ascertained unless and until we make the measurement. And so, whenever we, uh, whenever we take the simplest quantum situation, we say that we can measure it either in one of the two conditions, if it is a simple two-level system. And whenever we make the measurement, we would either find it always, either in one or the other case. And so as a result, the probability of making the measurement is somewhere in the middle given by the weighting factor of each of them. And that's how it becomes linear algebra. So what happens is that you take quantum mechanics, which is a complete physics phenomena and you frame it in terms of what we have shown here which was first given by Dirac which showed that quantum mechanics can be formulated in terms of linear algebra. The notation that has been used here is the bracket notation which essentially takes matrices and writes them down or vectors and writes them down in such a way so that you can treat this whole thing as linear algebra. And that is perhaps one of the biggest breakthroughs which has made quantum mechanics to be sort of acceptable to computer scientists and they do not have to really get into the nitty of the physics issues of the difficulty of handling it but to treat it as a linear algebra problem. So with this background, it becomes easier to look, to at least frame the concept of quantum However, one of the biggest caveat in this area still remains, which is how we will be doing the manipulation of that process as we go ahead. So here is a little bit of a history on this field. Um, uh, it has been started off, actually this is more like a time over certain aspects of quantum computation because I do not uh, belong to the computer science community, so uh, there are areas here which are missing. So I have given it as a certain uh, aspect, but everybody sort of believes that the whole process was started off by Benioff and Feynman, 
back in the early 80s and it has gone through its traumas of ups and downs and of late there are issues where we are thinking that optic, uh, that uh, some implementation possibilities are becoming um, realistic and the biggest implement biggest cause of this was uh, goes to Shor and Grover who first showed that algorithms do have an impact as a quantum computational device and so with this uh, search algorithm of Grover which came a little later uh, compared to that of uh, Shor's which is the uh, factorization these two algorithms paved the way of the usefulness into computer science aspect for doing quantum computing. And the first implementation aspects came in along in terms of realistic implementation which made some sense, came along in terms of the work done by Gershon, Phil Chuang, Cody, all the people, uh, all the people coming from MIT, uh, which sort of started the area that quantum computation is possible with bulk devices. Earlier to this, prior to this, it was always thought it was only single atoms or uh, devices which are only two-level systems which are not possible to be seen in any bulk media are necessary. So this brought over the change into the field which has allowed us to look at the system in a more realistic manner. However, there is a big caveat in this field of trying to do with NMR which I will come to in a moment. Uh, so there is a big drive try to do this whole aspect in a different way and optical analogs or the optical schemes to do the same approach is something which is becoming much more popular. There is another important aspect to it. This area of bringing in other fields sort of provides funding because these are connected to other areas of science and technology which can be propelled into this area. Uh, otherwise physicists like us we never get funds for trying to pursue whatever our dreams are. We have to tell that we are doing biology for example, we'll perhaps do a better imaging of your brain, then we will get the funding agencies stand up and give you some money. So that is partly the other part of the reason why these developments happen nowadays. There is another esoteric area which is distantly connected to this field of quantum computing which has also led to its development and that is something which is not really physics or computer science, it's the area of chemistry which sort of playing with molecules have brought it around into this field and in this field the idea has been to do chemistry in the most holy grail manner. When, when you were first taught chemistry at the very basic level, maybe in the high school level or even before that, the first introduction is you bring together two chemicals and you will get some product. What is not told to you is that it's black magic because the product which you want is not just the one that you get, you get a mixture. And so chemistry is still at the mind of the beginning child remains as alchemistry and they hate it the most thinking that you have to memorize it. That's the first thing and that's why when this holy grail of chemistry is talked about, it is much more convincing and much more easy at least to the trained mind of physicists because it talks about a molecule A uh, mixing with another molecule B and forming A or something similar to that where you are not talking about anything else but just a, th a, a particular product which has been formed because of certain happenings. Problem is this does not happen in reality because all these molecules or even or, or the uh, elements that we are talking about are quantum objects. And quantum objects, as we discussed from the very first talk, it is all probability which matters. And so the probability of their combinations gives rise to different results. And that's why in chemistry, the holy grail demands quantum computing to happen. And one of the important aspects which Feynman pointed out back in 1981 is the we will be able to solve Schrodinger's equation ex, uh, exactly if we can ever do quantum computing. And that is one of the things which is also dictating the fact that if we want our molecules or things to behave in the way in a classroom, 
then we would need to know how they progress. Otherwise, we will not know. Okay. So that is perhaps one of the reasons why a control of how molecules interact is very important. And one of the properties which work very well, uh, like in a classroom, you need a good teacher. In this particular case, you need light. Because light is perhaps one of the properties which has the best impact on all of the ways of how the interactions happen. And so it is possible to somehow address the molecules with the light in such a way so that the procedure occurs in the right direction. This particular area where the, the collective property of the molecular system is controlled is known as coherent control because we are actually using the coherence of all the molecules put together to behave in a certain way so that the randomness of the system is minimized. And that is how you would like to have quantum computing to develop because in quantum computation you are actually looking for certain answers, not a probabilistic distribution to the maximum level. And that is one of the reasons why this particular field requires the development of quantum computing, sorry, development of coherent control in the same way. So my background is actually in the field of uh, coherent control which I started off in my PhD in Princeton. Uh, so only the, only the applications change with time, but the main problem remains. The dream keeps on going. So the basic principle worked very well with NMR because in NMR the biggest advantage which remained was the fact that you could consider in the simplest possible, this by the way is a simple enough molecule for chemists and uh, in that particular case you can consider the spin of let's say one carbon atom which is fixed. These are by the way the nuclear spins, the electrons have too many things to worry about, it's just the nuclear part in the center body which is of one kind. So if it is fixed and the one which is the lighter part which is the proton or the hydrogen is changing with respect to that, application of a radio frequency pulse is one of the ways to relatively change the orientation of that with respect to this. And this was one of the tricks which was first used to show that in bulk for, uh, properties also you can single out a molecular aspect and talk about quantum computing. And this was one of the biggest breakthrough, which was the one which was the MIT group, uh, di uh, differently Chuang and Kashyap. At that time, Chuang was not at the MIT, but still, these people uh, had managed to show that by using a molecule where the individual spins could be addressed by radio frequency pulses, it is possible to now conduct a combination of experiments. So you go from a state which is a pure state of 0, 0 into a big state where they are going to have a, and this by the way is known as the classic Hadamard transform in terms of quantum language. So this is one of the ways how this whole thing was started. Unfortunately, as every system when it comes in has its own difficulties, the problem of NMR remains in the fact that it's not possible to scale beyond a certain limit. This became clear very quickly because the solution in MR, although it's very useful, there is something known as we are, we are waiting, we are actually utilizing the statistical properties to look at quantum aspects. And when you look at that, after a certain point of time, in order to get signal over noise, you have to go beyond the quantum noise levels. And so, very quickly, as the number of qubits increase, so it's very good for one qubit, two qubit, that's fine. But as you want to have larger number of qubits to be able to do something useful number of quantum computation, uh, it becomes very difficult. Okay. Even, I mean, it is now predicted that beyond 12 qubits, it is perhaps impossible to do it by an uh, NMR quantum computation because that you would be needing temperatures where no liquid can exist. And as soon as you go to solid state for NMR, things change completely. Because this random orientation changes is the one which makes 
the uh, liquid NMR address into one single system. So that's why uh, the NMR has its problem. Also, it's very slow. It works only at 10 to 100 hertz in terms of the molecular system to get reset. So if you want to do the computation, you need a much faster so the way the whole picture is defined is in terms of the uh, Feynman forward vector model, which is the same principle as looking at how the spin was rotating. That is by the way known as the block vector picture, but the same application is more generalized in case of optics by using the Feynman picture in which the, the spin is rotating as per the applied heat. And if we do this process slowly enough, then we lead to a move. We also are able to do things which are possible to be done in NMR, and that was the point of the far healing model of adiabatic quantum computing. And uh, I was working on quantum. Uh, I was working on adiabatic processes before on chemical systems, and it became quite natural for us to then jump into this field of doing adiabatic quantum computing. So, adiabatic quantum computing is a useful uh, process because what you can do is you can actually use the applied field to slowly change the process and be able to look at the uh, principles of quantum computing. However, one of the biggest problems which still remains in this particular case is the principle of decoherence. Now, in case of NMR, since the processor is slow, the decoherence is also very slow. So, you have enough time before the process is going to decover and so you can do a quantum system happen, quantum pro problem and the measurement happen before the decoherence sets in. However, in optics this does not happen. There are two different time scales here. One is intermolecular and in the intermolecular case you will be having because they are having collisions with them. Okay, now that is something which can depend on the environment. So we can choose how we would like this environment to be. We can use gases instead of liquids, we can use solids in certain forms and so we can minimize them. However, there is something more to it which is the intramolecular which is due to the molecules changing their characteristics within the system and this time scales vary from nanoseconds or below depending on what level of system we are dealing with. And that is one of the problems which it first created the biggest problem. So our first aim and the one the work that we first did was to look at how this can be treated. Now this, as I mentioned, is a direct analogy to what chemists are interested to know in terms of their particular problem of trying to do a control in chemistry. Because this is the same culprit which is the one which is not allowing a particular product to happen from a given compound. Okay, so uh, for example, here, are the, here is this molecule which is, I mean, is something which I have drawn with colors and balls. So don't expect them to be real molecules. I am not also a very good chemist that way. Uh, what we have done is that we have just drawn a particular bond, molecule where we are trying to address a particular bond. If I try to address this bond, I would expect that particular bond to vibrate, right? When that vibrates, I would expect that bond to break. That is the basic idea. However, as I have mentioned, these are essentially not particular. Uh, these are essentially not individual items. They are springs, quantum systems, and so very soon they all start vibrating. Okay. I mean, this is a simple thing. Whenever you put together uh, things tied together with. Uh, Know, springs they all start vibrating whenever you pluck on one of them and so you will not be able to just break this bond as you were expecting any other part of the molecule start vibrating and this is the main problem of intramolecular vibration relaxation which does not let the bond that is addressed to be broken any bond which is weak in this entire system will start breaking it that's why multiple systems happen the the other part of the problem which happens is that whenever you are addressing or you are doing any measurement, there is another problem that you are doing a perturbation to the system. So, although you learn about 
quantum mechanics or all the isolated system and the mathematics is meant for the case where we have not perturbed it. Whenever you try to make a measurement or whenever you try to do anything with it, it can be one of the radiation based experiments that I mentioned. It will change the system to something new. Okay, and so this is another issue that you have to take care of that on application of any process, it is going to change it. Okay, it need not be something that it is going to change to break down or something, but it's not going to be the same situation anymore. You can take advantage of it, and that is exactly what is done when you are doing a DIVATI computing. This is exactly one of the ways of taking advantage of the problem. What is done in that case is that the states are separated far enough so that they do not behave in the particular way that they would have otherwise. And so if the field is changed smoothly, then the system tracks along a particular pathway which makes it go from its original ground state to let's say the ground uh, excited state without producing any other side effect. And this is the typical way of showing uh, uh, adiabatic passage without going into too many equations. So uh, you can actually do for a simple two level system, you can smoothly go into an excited state without creating any other uh, side effects. And the place where everything is put together is the condition where you have a perfect coherence. Okay, so now these kinds of experiments have been done and uh, it was possible to be shown that you know, when in one particular case as you drive the system it will go in between both up and down states whereas if you make it go smoothly to the other condition then it will go up into the other state. And in reality, in a system where there are lots of molecules there, these oscillations average out and you get a 50% distribution, whereas the other case you do get a 2 is to 1. So you can actually create a lot more population in that case. So in, in, in typical case, you can say that this is how the decoherence picture looks like, that you have one spring which you plucked. It went and to, to the other states and it finally it goes away. Or in other words, the, the excitation itself is not clean. There are many, many states into which the strength is sort of distributed. This is what the idea of looking at it. And so if you actually use some pulse which comes to a certain level and then stays constant over that level, then during the period when the states are all together, then that is where you have created coherence. And the, the, during the coherence period, the states which are trying to couple to the other states are not able to do it and so the energy and so all the states are in that condition. And that is one of the ways to make sure that these decoupling the other states do not happen. And so you can actually convert, this is one of the tricks of converting a multi-level system into a two-level system. And this is a, this is a actually a real life example which was taken from, uh, this work was done by, uh, original work, experimental was done by Peter Felker and so one of the work which finally was recognized in the Nobel Prize of Zwill where it was shown that all these systems are essentially decoherent into other states. So that's how I connected to the chemistry because this is how he had originally showed how molecular systems do not remain in one state. They are springs dissipating away and years later his work was recognized for Nobel Prize. But what, what we are trying to look at and what we have shown is that if the same model is, uh, uh, I made it even more complex here. Anyway, if the same model is now uh, subjected to a condition where the states are not able to couple to each other, then we can model this. This is, by the way, writing down the Hamiltonian of how this evolves and how many states are concerned. And we can also look at it in much more complex ways. Instead of using only a single wave or pulse of light, we can have many photons coming together, which makes life much more simpler. So that you can address the entire state by having less energetic photons which come together to do the same effect. This has other impacts. We are not getting into those details here. But it is possible to do so. 
and even if you have very complex situations, it is possible to uh, make sure that these systems are able to be controlled by this particular way. And all depends on the phase of the laser which is being addressed. And so the laser phase is something where the Taylor series can be put together to such a way that we are using only the first order of it and we are keeping the system under control. And so here is a as a uh, problem which is shown here where you would like where we have managed to show that within a period of time, this is just a model calculation, so these time and scales do not matter. But generally there is a period of time over which the system is only going to be a two-level system, although it is something which has many, many states in it. So in other words, that picture where I started where the vibration was quickly going away to the other states will not happen. It will just remain contained in that. And uh, this principle of this principle that we are able to address it and keep it locked into a certain state is by use of the ADV electricity principle. Okay. The other thing which can, which this allows us to do is to also establish the Hadamard gate for a multi-level system. What we can do is we can uh, keep all the states decoupled and have a distribution only between the ground and the multiple number of bright states where all the bright states are now reset to a certain particular energy level. And that is given by the combination of all the states possible. And that's how it, it is actually a Hadamard state where all the bright states are having equal distribution. This is by the way a very important step in Grover's algorithm where in one of the steps it is necessary to equipopulate all possible qubits. And so this is one of the steps this is necessary in doing Grover's algorithm. So I mean here is an example of a multi-qubit gate that can be formulated by using these kinds of light pulse sequences in a model multi-level system. Okay, now after coming here, it became interesting to look at what is happening about the coherence because whenever I am mentioning about the states coupling together, there is a region where I am saying that all of them are sharing the same energy, I mean they are all equally populated. What is happening to the coherence in the state? We know that coherence is very essential for this particular system to happen. So what is the difference between, let's say, a case where I am not using adiabatic conditions and the case where I am just using a pulse of light where it's actually not going to keep any coherence, it's going to distribute its energy to all the states. And so in the process, the decoherence is maximized. So what is the two difference in the two different cases? Okay. Now, there are two ways of looking at it. One is to say that I will compare apples and oranges, in which I will say that I will be fair to the two systems. And I will say that whenever I excite and the coherence is going to be distributed equally, then I am going to say that the adiabatic principle is better. Now, that is unfair in some sense. Because I am taking advantage of the fact that I already know in one case coherence is going to go away. I have already shown to you that happens. But there is another way of looking at it which is done all the time in NMR and that's why NMR became so popular. Is that you can give something known as a pi pulse. A pi pulse is nothing but a pulse which has an appropriate area under the pulse so that in a two level system the photons, uh, the system will just, with the spin of the system will just go into the outer excited state. Okay, now you can set up a situation like that also. In that particular case also, it's a, it, in that particular case we say that it's a perfectly coherent situation. And that's why we wanted to, cut, we wanted to uh, see how these two particular cases, where both of the cases we know that coherence is there. One is under the adiabatic condition where actually we are sweeping the field so that we go from the ground to the excited state. And in the other case, where we are actually giving a pi pulse and we are seeing the two states and it's going only to the excited state. The coherent structures of the, these two states, are they different or not? And this is what we found, is that they are completely opposite. In the sense that what we were now doing was we were probing 
uh, see, in theory you can do certain things which you cannot do while doing an experiment. In theory, I can always look at the off-diagonal elements of a matrix, of the density matrix. And it is known, let me just tell you that, that the off-diagonal matrix elements of a density matrix always tells you about the coherence between the two states that we are looking at. If you look at the off-diagonal elements of a density matrix, then you are actually going to probe the coherence of the entire system as you are doing the process. And in that way, what we have done is we have just compared the two cases and we find that there are two different cases. One is the adiabatic process and in the other case we are giving a pi pulse. They are behaving, one is going via the real, so the octagonal elements are complex numbers. So they are real and imaginary parts. So what we find is in one case, it is following the real path and in the other case it is following the imaginary path. So much so that it is only real and only imaginary depending on whether it is actually a pi pulse which is just doing an inversion or when it is an adiabatic process when I am actually changing the field so that it goes slowly to the other case. Now this came as a surprise because this was never seen before. This is something which had not been probed in this particular way before and we were consistently finding this to happen that whenever we are looking at one particular case and the other case like this and uh, we, we looked at it very carefully and what we observed was this that we know from other studies that, you know when we, when we look at uh, spectroscopy or system we know that uh, there is a Kramer's Conley relationship physics which actually relates the absorption and the dispersion of the system. So this is uh, uh, the fiber optics and electrical engineering people know it very well that the material dispersion and the absorption are related to each other by uh, the Kramer's Conley relation where all the absorptions are composed of the real part and the uh, composed of the real and imaginary part and the real part is the dispersive part and the imaginary part is the absorbed part. And what we realize is that whenever we were happening, we were doing uh, the Rabi flopping, which is the pi, 2 pi, 3 pi kind of a condition. The coupling is through absorption. And that makes sense because the system is actually absorbing the energy and it's going to the other state. Whereas when we are doing the adiabatic process where we are actually changing the phase of the system so that the population goes and smoothly parts itself in the other state. We are changing the nature of the state. It is the, it is the dispersive part of the process which is happening and there is no population flopping. So there is no energy really absorbed into the system and still the system character is changing from the ground to the exercise state. Okay, and this is definitely one of the powers of why adiabatic quantum computing seems to be much more powerful than and in fact if you are somewhere in the middle where it's not adiabatic then the system is flopping between the ground and the, uh, the real and imaginary states like anything. Okay, um, <clears throat> so our job essentially is to try to do these kinds of experiments by uh, changing the property of the light as I mentioned. Changing the property of the light in itself is a complex task for the time scales that we are talking about. Whenever we move from NMR to optics, the time scale is reduced by a factor of 100 or 1000 or more. And that is one of the reasons why the typical ways of doing the uh, doing these changeover processes became much more difficult. And so what has happened is we have to take indirect schemes to do it. One of our indirect schemes is to do an optical Fourier transformation. What we do is we take the light pulse, um, then Fourier transform it with the help of a curve uh, mirror and a grating pair so that we get uh, the Fourier components here. And then we change the property in the Fourier domain because there the time doesn't play any role. Now it's only the Fourier components. And then we reverse Fourier transform it so that we can get back in the time domain what we are looking for in the time. So that is one of the technology that is necessary to be developed. And that we have done now. So we have all these experimental results where it shows that we can actually uh, change the way the shape of the laser pulses 
both in time as well as in wavelength. And it is more important that we now we can even simultaneously determine them and talk about their phases. So with these developments, okay. So this is actually a, a little bit a step in terms of how these, <coughs> how different a pulse is in, as compared to a typical laser. So for example, my laser here that I'm using as a pointer is this one, where I have a continuous wave. And so its uh, frequency or the wavelength is a single wavelength, which is a delta function. Whereas when we use the pulse laser and the short of the pulse we make, it's in fact a very broad frequ uh, frequency spectrum, which is very useful. I mean, that is one of the things that we have currently in our advantage in terms of communication also, because we can modulate and send so much of information content within a particular period of time. So TDM, for example, or CDMA actually works very well as you go to shorter and shorter pulses because that actually helps with the bandwidth and sending the information. The same technology is actually now we are talking about putting them on molecules for them to do the computation. Okay, so as far as implementation goes, what we have now told you is that we are making the molecules do the implementation because those are the quantum objects. We are asking the molecules to do the job by the addressability which is the light. And the light is being modulated so that you can do the work. The only unfortunate part is that the modulation of that short pulse of light itself is a technology which we have fortunately developed for particularly other purposes which we are now applying for doing the quantum computation kind of a work. So this is the entire picture of a one way of doing uh, implementation which we are pursuing. Now, uh, a couple of small points here. There is another way of doing, the, the, the other reason why light is quite an interesting. In this particular case, what we have done is that the light is almost being used as a classical object because we are only using it to address and to read. We are not doing anything else with it. However, we can always use the polarization component of light and that is what is typically used in the entangled, uh, in the in, in um, Alice and Bob kind of a problem where we are sending bits and uh, doing measurements. Because in those cases, typically, you only need uh, two qubits very often to do much of the information transaction to happen. If you need more of them, then it becomes slightly more difficult. So this I have already explained to you. Uh, okay, so the other part of the problem, the one that we use actually uses an episodic modulator which allows us to program it and that is important because you know, the addressability of the system depends on the exact profile of the laser that you use. Unfortunately, this writing is slow. This is a grating which is being written. Uh, so we have to catch the exact one. So there is a fast gate here which is an electrophilic modulator. These are details which happen and give us the results. Uh, Okay, so <clears throat> these are the different aspects of work that has been going on, which includes the other kind of uh, experiments which get coupled in order to uh, make the quantum computing happen. Uh, a lot of it remains in the development of uh, pulse wave, which we have sort of now got into control. We can now actually have we have developed a uh, generic algorithm which sort of tells what kind of a pulse is best suited for a particular algorithm, for example, necessary for a molecule to re uh, refer to. So mostly these molecules nowadays that we are using are dye molecules because they seem to have the best response to the light that we give to. So that is one of the ways we are going about it. Um, uh, we have looked at some traveling salesman problem which I am not going to look at. I have not discussed it here. And we have been working on adiabatic quantum computing because that seems like the most important aspects of it. So this is the kind of technology that we have used for these kinds of work. Uh, it's a laser system which has a certain home built part and certain commercial components. And uh, the other uh, part of the story why quantum computing or quantum objects are interesting is that you can produce entangled photons as we mentioned and these entangled photons fortunately are also thought to 
give much more information than a typical uh, scan of your brain, for example. So you can do uh, optical tomography, which is supposed to give you much more information than the classical uh, optical tomography that is being pursued. So we have a section of work which is on also developing into that area. And since often we want to keep the molecules far apart so that the intermolecular effects do not bother us, we have a very high water vacuum chamber where we essentially produce a molecular beam where each molecule is essentially independent of the effect of the other and these are roughly at the level of 10 to the power minus 8 or 9 top. So I have tried to give you a flavor of the kinds of things that we are doing based on quantum computing. Um, we also have some amazing work which I have not talked about and uh, I could not resist showing you certain uh, imaging. Actually one thing which we are trying to develop which I did not discuss here in detail is that we are trying to develop an analog to MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, which is the what you do whenever you go for a scan. The reason for that is not only medicine but also quantum computing because it turns out that the uh, NMR schemes are still very useful. The only caveat remaining there is the number of qubits that you can scale to. If I can do the same kind of work only with optics, without using magnetic field, and without using the but remaining with the principles as I developed, as I showed you by the Feynman Goldman diagram instead of the block vector, then I should be able to extend the same principles there. So this is one of the first steps towards the direction where we have actually shown that three laser pulses can be pressed. So the new pulse, which is the image of all the three put together and that should contain all the information and the coherence properties of all the three pulses, which is our image and which should be the 2D signal. So this is sort of a uh, field which is developing. So with that, um, I have talked to you about uh, a lot of things including some aspects of pulse shaping of very short pulses. Um, I um, have been talking about intramolecular dephasing and uh, adiabatic conditions and I have given you some examples of how laser pulses can perhaps be used for doing quantum computing as well. Um, nothing is possible without students and so these are the students that we have very hard working PhD as well as UGM tech students who do most of the work for us and with that I would like to thank you.